Okay. Welcome to today's session of Open Texas 2022. I'm Shelley Barba with the Open Texas Conference Committee, and I will be moderating this session. Thank you all for joining us today and uh, for three approaches to OER adoption and maintenance. Hi everyone, I am Tamar Bell from North Central Texas College, and I'll give it over to my two co-presenters to introduce their names. I'm Sarah Gattardi, I teach Spanish. I'm Jared Entz, I teach technical writing and other English classes. We can go to the next slide if that's okay. So um, I teach speech in the foreign languages department. I've been teaching speech for over 12 years now. So a lot of those communication courses and we can go on to the next slide. We just wanted to welcome all of you to our presentation. Um, as Shelly read the title, Three Approaches to OER Adoption and Maintenance. And um, one of our goals and three of our goals by the end of this presentation is first that we would um, just create awareness regarding field specific considerations when selecting an OER. Um, second, to identify the impact legislation has on creation, maintenance and sharing of these resources. And last, to discuss the importance of broad faculty participation in order for the resource um, to um, just be successful, right? So um, these are three things we hope Hope you take away amongst many more through this presentation. So we can go to the next slide, please. So again, I'm Tamar Bell and I'll be starting off this conversation. And I wanted to start off by just sharing my why. Why did I choose OER and how this journey went for me in this process? And uh, my, my story on the why is really uh, uh, just comes from a place of compassion and sympathy for my students. I was a community college student and I was a, a first generation college student. So just trying to navigate the world of college um, with not uh, much support from, you know, family and friends uh, experiences from that. So I was just trying to figure it out. And I remember I walked into the, the bookstore on the first week of college and I had a $300 credit card that I was approved for. And I had to buy all my books on that one credit card. And my biology textbook was $320. <laughs> so I was kind of at a crossroads. I was like, I'm not sure how I'm going to make this work, but I'm going to figure it out. And I quickly figured out that college hack where, you know, if you buy an older edition, then you might save some money on textbooks. So that was the first question I would always ask my instructor. Can I buy an older edition? How far back can I go in the edition before we lose relevancy in this class? So I think just like remembering that story of where I started as a college student and just kind of relaying that experience um, that I've had to make sure that cost is not a barrier to students. And I think this is um, maybe a lot of the reason why uh, OER is something that we wanna learn more about because the barrier of textbook costs. So um, that was my why. And then um, last spring I had a, a student in my class, uh, she was a single mom and she walked into the bookstore and um, the copies had just run out. And by the time she went back to get another copy, you know, she just felt like she was too far behind and we had we had lost her. So uh, retention is important to so many of us as administrators and faculty. And um, that's why I decided to kind of emphasize adapting an OER into my course. So we can go to the next slide. So a little bit about my journey. I'm just going to give you an overview in the chronological process of what this looked like. So the first thing I set out to do is just figure out what I was looking for. So my division chair had asked me to rewrite a curriculum for our interpersonal communication course. And this was a, a little bit larger of a challenge because it's not as common as a communication course as uh, public speaking would be and or introduction to speech communication, which is an overview of the field of communication studies. So it, it was a little bit harder to find. So I had to do a lot of digging in that early work. So I knew I wanted a bit more uh, of a formal compiled textbook that, you know, students could read from in different options in different ways. And um, that that's exactly what I was looking for. And we know that's not the only way OERs are offered, but I that's what I was looking for. And it kind of helped me filter through that process um, after many conversations with my division chair. So when I, I, I think I 
emailed old division chairs. I contacted old, old colleagues from my, you know, graduate seminar cohorts and all these things I can think of. And um, I really wasn't finding what I was looking for in that process. So I think um, by that time, I had come to this decision that I was going to compile my own OER and just kind of pull different articles and things that I could find where um, I was in the midst of the process of doing that. I realized that I had found exactly what I was looking for on Libra text. And um, I had not known about that website as I was starting my OER adaption journey. And I ended up really liking what they had to offer. So um, that kind of pivoted my plan and my blueprint. And um, over the summer, the summer of 2022, I enrolled in the Creator Academy sponsored by the THECB. And that was a huge help in my journey. I felt like I was just learning so much and there was so much uh, work to be done, but they kind of gave me that like that framework to to really understand how it all worked and just that process. So the Creator Academies gave me a lot of depth in what I needed to know uh, to better compile my OER. So once I had that Libra text, it was really good. They also offered a lot of of support. Um, I know uh, the, the host of the, the Creator Academies, Megan um, Simmons, she had given me a lot of good feedback on, oh, you can use, you know, there's a tool right within Libra Text where you can adapt the OER and remix the OER, just things that I didn't know about that were already av available to me. So I didn't have to like reinvent the whole process on my own. So um, I did learn a lot and they also had uh, a lot of support um, in office hours, they had office hours available for me to ask questions and get one-on-one -on -one training. So I think professional development for me was a key in this process to um, doing it well <laughs> and uh, making sure that I had the support that I needed. Um, and then I like brought it all together. So I adapt, I picked the textbook, the OER that I was going to use, and then. I decided like, okay, now we have to put it into practice. I read through the textbook and um, just making adaptations and then creating content for my course for it. And uh, it, it, there was a lot more than I realized in, in terms of time, which um, takes me over to the next slide. So the, the main challenge that I had in this process was uh, the time it took. I think there was a lot of, uh, things that I needed to allocate time for that I didn't realize. So one thing in the context of the OER that I had chosen was just writing quiz material questions that took a lot of time. Um, I think I, I took three weeks doing that. <laughs> Maybe that was just me, but I think just um, allocating enough time to properly go through the material and write, um, you know, questions that would really uh, cause for students to engage in critical reasoning and critical thinking through the process was important to us as a department and a division. So it, it did take a lot of time. Um, funding was also uh, an important key factor. Uh, my co-presenter, Jared, will kind of speak more into this. So I'll, I'll leave the, the conversation on grants and funding to, to his uh, valuable experiences on this. But um, I think it, it, it just took a lot more time than I realized. So uh, one piece of advice that I always uh, share when asked is just the importance of making sure you have time. I think ideally, and this might, might not make sense for everyone, it was good that I, I had the summer session to work on this and I had a bit more flexibility where I didn't have a, a teaching load or a heavy teaching load where I could just focus on the, the process of adapting the OER. So um, the, like I had mentioned, Creator Academies was also very helpful. So professional development is uh, a huge role in this process to just kind of get the basics, get the blueprints, get the things that I need to do. And I was a complete novice. The only thing I had done prior to this was like helping my division chair vet two OERs for two other courses. So I was just giving feedback, but I wasn't like as submersed in the process as I was um, in this past year when I was doing it for our interpersonal communication. Um, just uh, utilizing the tools that are already there. I know um, on a panel I was on yesterday, there's a lot of uh, 
or the OER Texas repository was really helpful to just kind of search what they already had there. There's also a lot of like professional development already available on the repository website that can walk you through the basics of this whole process. So I think that was very helpful. Um, and then uh, just, just the idea of just having support. So moving forward, what I plan to do, I think we had a question, um, Creator Academy is a workshop. Uh, yes, it was um, open to faculty. I'm not sure if it's record recorded, but I can check and get back to you on that. So um, moving forward, uh, what I wanna do with the course is continue adapting the book um, since the, the copyright of the original OER is um, share alike and um, I'm able to remix, um, I'm going to kind of add chapters in that I felt like maybe students didn't have enough theory and depth on in interpersonal communication. So that's one thing I plan to do and just collect feedback from students. So this was the first semester after I uh, kind of applied all the curriculum and wrote the questions and the assignments where students have uh, the the textbook live to them on day one. So, so far I've gotten good feedback. I've implemented some, you know, surveys so that they can give me uh, qualitative feedback on how it worked for them. And just kind of the bigger picture on how it might help retention and just continuing this conversation throughout our, our institution at North Central Texas College and then um, as higher education in general throughout Texas. So um, I'm really excited about the work. I'm really excited about what I learned. It was quite the process and journey, but um, I think it was valuable to my growth as an instructor and then just kind of relaying all those things to my students and getting the feedback to them in that process moving forward. So thanks for letting me share. I'm gonna move it on to uh, Dr. Guattardi. So hi, I'm Sarah Guattardi. I teach Spanish and I'm in charge of the Spanish course templates. If we could go to the next slide, please. So why did I choose to move away from publisher resources? So full disclosure, I actually use a no cost solution instead of an OER. My materials are not publicly available outside of my institution, and this has a lot to do with the fact that for my subject area, an educational resource needs to incorporate at least audio components in addition to the text in order to be useful. The OERs for Spanish that I've seen, and I acknowledge that the resources are ever expanding, but what I've seen are mostly texts that don't include listening or independent learning activities. As a result, our no-cost solution is hosted in our learning management system as the simplest way for me to share the materials with my colleagues. Again, why did we make the switch? When I was hired, the materials I inherited cost about $130 and were used for three semesters. However, during the first semester, I realized there were issues with the accessibility of audio and video components. I did reach out to the publisher with my concerns and specific examples of the issue, but when the new edition was released, no updates to accessibility were included. Originally, I had considered switching to the materials the adjunct instructors were using in other schools, but it was by the same publisher, and I didn't want to risk more accessibility issues. I also was not overly impressed with the quality of online activities. I always felt that aside from graphics and animation, I could create comparable or better exercises. Lastly, I had heard from other instructors about the headaches that updated editions could cause. I figured I could avoid a lot of that if I was using departmentally created materials, but that came with its own challenges. On the next slide, we're gonna talk about faculty involvement in the creation and maintenance of our materials. I'm the only full-time faculty member in Spanish. We regularly have two to three adjuncts every semester. I created the text and designed the online course templates, which include handouts, videos, and activities for each class period. That includes the written and oral exams. One of our adjuncts was wonderful at identifying typos. When creating multilingual materials, spelling checkers become the enemy. I'm a great speller in English and Spanish, but I'm a typo queen when I work or think bilingually. That adjunct and another have been diligent to contribute to the instructional materials and expand the exam banks, since that is a major contributor in reducing opportunities for cheating. 
The contributions are dropped into a shared workspace in our learning management system so that they can be copied over to the course template. That, of course, sounds easier than it is, since we run our courses in three formats with course templates specific to each semester length. The course templates do require updates every semester to clean up issues that pop up due to various system updates. The next slide is going to talk about learning opportunities. I can say that switching to a no-cost solution has been challenging due to the amount of work it takes, but I can also say I've learned a lot from the process. I have become very familiar with captions and SRT files, which are the timed video files. Let me tell you, do not trust auto-generated captions. One unexpected issue I learned to look out for are timing errors. As you can see on the image, this auto-generated file has overlapping timestamps that cause the captions to be displayed incorrectly. You can see caption five runs from second 11 through second 17, but caption six runs from second 14 through second 20. That makes it difficult to read the captions when the video is playing. Another issue is accuracy. You can see I'm speaking mostly English in these captions, but for some reason, the captions become random gibberish in a variety of language. Instead of, so you should be understanding some of these words, dibujar is to draw, we have skoitit bren restan examinus words a dibujar sting ground. Yes, those of you who have English monolingual videos can expect much better accuracy. However, if you, like me, work in different languages, be prepared to put in a good amount of time correcting captions. And for those of you who work in English, don't be lulled into spot checking. I did that originally, and it can be very misleading. Again, you might find random changes into gibberish, but that's if you're lucky. On the next slide is a not so lucky example. As you can see on the right side, the correctly transcribed side, I'm innocently introducing the goals for that day's lesson. But the auto captions said I was speaking English instead of Spanish. You can see that the computer created its own make-believe narrative. How to win a federal election. Does the opponent and a Muslim assume that Ladka doesn't get that? It's amazing. The computer continued the imaginary narrative for several minutes. If you're working only in one language, you're not likely to run into this bad of an issue. But if you, like me, work in multiple languages, the accuracy of auto captions drops significantly, and auto generated captions may not be able to deal with bilingual videos. You may end up with false narratives or random words in arbitrary languages. However, it is helpful to use the auto-generated captions as a starting point for cleaning up the SRT file. On the next slide, I'll share a few other learning points that would have been helpful to know at the outset of the project. I'll say that after many hours captioning, I do have to agree with the general recommendation to create a script before recording videos. While I was aware of this recommendation, I didn't think I had time to do that. But let me save you the trouble. Whether you create it beforehand or as you transcribe to correct the captions, you are going to end up creating a script. It's faster to start off with one because then you can use the script to help you correct the SRT files. Remember those sections of gibberish where it's impossible to figure out what the audio is saying. And there are two other bonuses. You'll spend less time recording the videos since you won't forget to include important clarifications. And you won't drive your students crazy having to hear 20 ums, or in my case, so, in each recording. Save yourself time and save your students that annoyance. Start with a script. Another area to watch out for are the impact varying semester lengths can have on materials. Recently, for some odd reason, one of the semesters had five days of difference from the normal rotation. That's one thing if it's a face-to-face -face class. It's not a huge problem, but it's not an easy task either. Imagine now the impact that has on either recording more materials or cutting materials that are already recorded. In my case, I'm the one who has access to the original video files. So even if I'm not actually teaching that semester, I'm the one who makes those video and caption revisions, even though the others can take over text revisions. Also, having to account for fixes to the text and the learning management system and media 
has slowed my ability to make actual content revisions to the courses. I still have dared to make major revisions, but I have to factor into my decision-making all of the time required to synchronize the revisions across the different components. The last learning point is materials hosting. Originally, I had our course videos hosted outside of our learning management system. However, that was a problem because of different updates within our learning management system and very frequent updates to privacy policies and settings in the video host. It became necessary to migrate the videos out of the video host and into our learning management system. From the student experience side, I think it looks better. It requires less clicks to access, and there are less issues with connection. However, the captions in our video host did not transfer into our learning management system. You guessed it. Every video needed to be recaptioned, or the SRT file had to be uploaded for each individual video. Lots of fun. But that will segue into the last topic I want to discuss on the next slide. I started designing my first fully online course during the 2015-2016 academic year. That's when my original training to teach online and Quality Matters instruction took place. I ran my first fully online courses starting fall of 2016. However, since then, laws have changed, and that has required updates that I didn't anticipate when I made the switch from publisher materials. In January of 2018, there was an update to Section 508 that said for synchronized media, transcripts alone don't meet accessibility standards. Had I stayed with the publisher materials, we would have been out of compliance. They had defended their position by saying the transcripts were available for all of the videos, therefore they were accessible. For my own instructional videos, even though I had tried hard to include on screen all of the ideas I was communicating, I realized I needed to improve the captions. I took a training last fall that said captions need to be 100% accurate. Yikes. Although I didn't find that percentage of accuracy requirement when I was researching section 508, the idea is the captions need to be right. And I think that takes a human and it takes a lot of time. Also, as I was reviewing my captions, I realized that there were times when I was visually marking information with the cursor on screen and that needed to be identified. As a result of the Texas Administrative Code chapter 202 and State Bill 944 from 2019, our institution has become stricter on what freeware and software we can use instructionally due to the stricter state requirements to protect information and enhance cybersecurity. I'll say again, originally, I had the course videos hosted outside of our institution, and at times my students would run across a security error when trying to link out to the video host. Also, since privacy and cybersecurity regulations will probably become stricter over time, it just seems safer to keep everything hosted directly in our learning management system. So where materials, particularly media resources, will be hosted is definitely something to consider when designing or adopting course materials. I hope this information has been helpful to you, and I tried to think about the information that I would have liked to know before I started the process. I look forward to interacting with you after Jared's presentation. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jared Entz, and I'm responsible for de developing and maintaining technical writing resources at NCTC. I didn't decide to use open educational resources in place of a traditionally published textbook for NCTC's technical writing course uh, because of problems with those traditional materials. I actually really liked the textbook that we were using. It was clear and concise. It had good examples, and it opened with the best advice, I think, every technical writer should hear. Uh, no one wants to read what you've written. Uh, they need to in order to do their job. But as I began thinking about updating the technical writing template and considering my textbook options, I realized that my traditional textbook didn't really offer anything that wasn't available online in an open source format. Even though technical writing OER options are limited, what is available does cover the concepts well. And uh, next slide, please. The reason I decided to switch to an OER textbook was really about creating a more equitable environment for my students. Every student starts the course day one 
with access to the textbook and all of the course materials. There's no waiting on shipping, payday, or financial aid. Students can start learning the moment they access the course. I knew that switching to OER wouldn't fix everything. Adequate student access to internet and computers is still a problem at NCTC, for example. But this felt like the right step in the right direction. Next slide, please. Uh, the, cost, the cost of textbooks played a noticeable role in my decision. Before the switch, a new version of our traditional textbook was $79.25 at NCTC's bookstore. The bookstore price is comparable to many online resources, uh, many online retailers. Uh, during the 2021 to 2022 academic year, as I developed, tested, and revised the template, NCTC ran nine sections of technical writing that used only OER materials, serving 187 students. Some students rent textbooks and some buy new ones and some don't buy textbooks at all. But we estimate that these students saved collectively up to $14,819. Uh, this semester is the first semester that all NCTC instructors are using OER material in, the in their technical writing courses. That's 123 students this semester collectively saving up to $9,747 which means that NCTC technical writing students have saved up to $24,000 since we first began implementing the OER. Uh, my point is that our course template, the template all online instructors and many in-person instructors use, needed to be updated. And considering all the benefits to our students, I couldn't think of a good reason not to switch to OER materials. It seemed like a simple idea and a straightforward task, but I didn't understand the scope of the task to which I was about to commit. Next slide, please. Uh, I received some really good advice from my department chair as I began this process. Um, she said, make sure that I get paid for my work. I might not have realized the true scope of the project I was envisioning, but I think she did. And together we found, applied for, and were awarded a grant to fund the project. Uh, the Open Educational Resources Course Development and Implementation Grant Program offered by the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board is intended to fund the development of OER and or the redesign of the courses to use OER. The THECB's website shows that a version of this grant was created for 2018, 2020, and 2021. The development portion of the grant offers matching grants up to $25,000 to support faculty teams in developing new OER for online course delivery. The implementation portion of the program, which is what I was awarded, offers matching grants up to $5,000 to support faculty in redesign of a course um, to, to use uh, existing OER. I had already chosen an existing textbook. I just needed to develop the course that would use it. Next slide. From start to finish, this whole process took me two years. During the fall 2020 semester, I chose an OER textbook and by January, I had submitted my grant application. Awardees were supposed to be announced early in the spring, but between the ongoing pandemic and the February freeze, this was delayed until July, 2021. Once I was awarded the grant, I began writing the course and preparing for a fall 2021 pilot. To be honest, after the delay, I created a course in a great hurry, and I'm grateful that I had an excellent and forgiving partner piloting the course with me. She incorporated my delayed updates and models into her classes we taught, and she offered excellent advice as I continued to write and to revise the course as, as we taught it. Uh, the grant required two semesters of piloting and revision, so essentially we repeated the process during the spring 2022 semester. I cannot overstate the value of collaboration during this stage of the process. I worked with two other professors to pilot the, the course throughout the academic year, and NCTC, as part of its matching support for the grant, hired an external reviewer to critique the course between semesters. All three of these experts made this course so much better than I could have alone. And with their help, it became much more than I had initially envisioned. In preparation for the fall 2022 semester, 
I published the finished, revised, and updated template to NCTC's learning management system and made it available for all English instructors to use. And as one of the requirements for my grant, I also published it, uh, published the course to the OERTX database, which is sponsored by the THECB, to, and made it available to anyone uh, throughout Texas and beyond. Uh, next slide, please. The final product is more than just lesson plans and assignments. I'm grateful to NCTC's fantastic grant writers uh, who pushed me way beyond my comfort zone and helped me to propose a project that included additional built-in support for both instructors and students. Um, in addition to 16 lessons with accompanying assignments, I created a writing toolkit with tips, examples, advice, and additional OER materials for students to use. Uh, instructor support, such as lesson-specific advice, weekly announcements, video scripts, sample videos, and slideshows, and professionally produced videos introducing the course and overviewing the major projects. All of these materials are now Creative Commons licensed for anyone to use. Um, I should say our, our goal, one of the goals in instructor support um, was to make, make something a new hire could use uh, immediately. Um, this is something I think other presentations today have talked a lot about, and I wanted to make sure that I mentioned that that, that was one of our focuses as well. Um, this OER project was incredibly rewarding, and I'm very happy that I undertook it. Uh, researching and creating the assignment and support structures for the course and receiving regular feedback from both students and peers as I developed and revised the course really helped me grow as a teacher. Uh, finding ways to work multiple OER materials into a single cohesive resource was definitely a challenge too, but I think I'm now better versed in the subject matter because of it. Another component of this project that was particularly valuable was the professional development opportunities offered by the THECB. As part of the grant, I got to participate in the FOCI, Creating More Equitable and Effective Open Resources series presented by uh, UT Texas at, at um, University of Texas at Austin, uh, their Charles A. Dana Center, which was 24 hours of professional development that helped me design my course to be more useful to more students. Uh, next slide. This process wasn't without its challenges. Uh, work across multiple organizations always moves slower than anyone wants it to. And I had to adjust my schedule and plan for this project many times. Uh, and work with digital resources, especially open resources, does require a degree of flexibility. For example, uh, the creator of some of my OER materials moved his resources to a new website this past summer. And I discovered this just as I was racing to meet the grant deadline to upload my course to OERTX. Before I could continue uploading, I had to examine and update the links I'd incorporated throughout my lessons and assignments. I know this could happen again tomorrow, and I'd have to rush to repeat the process for my current class and uh, the course template so that other instructors and, and students could continue to use these resources. Here's another challenge that I didn't expect. My initial goal for this project was to create something useful for my students and for my peers at NCTC. But because of my grant, I also published the materials publicly. And now my new goal is that instructors and students across the state find these materials useful too. So far, I haven't succeeded in this new goal. Uh, I initially published my materials to OERTX in October 2021, and I revised and updated them in August 2022. So far, they've only been viewed a handful of times, and I don't think that anyone outside of NCTC has used them. I, of course, worry that perhaps the project I poured so much time into isn't actually that great. That's entirely possible, and it's not a good feeling. Uh, but at the same time, I'm also confident that I have actually created something worthwhile. So I think that the lack of interest I see in the database might come down to marketing. I still have a lot to learn about how to tag and present these materials in the database, um, how to make sure that, that users who search for technical writing materials can actually find mine. And I hope that as OERTX continues to grow and as more instructors become interested in OER, there will be more eyes on what I've created. 
finding useful OER isn't a challenge that I've talked about much uh, about talk, talked much about here, uh, but it is one worth acknowledging. Uh, when I began looking for OER options for my technical writing course, I didn't have much luck for several months. There just aren't a lot of resources available in the field. And while many of the ones that are available are fantastic, it took time and help from NC other NCTC faculty for me to find them. And to be frank, I got pretty lucky. Uh, technical writing is an anomaly in the English field because there are, in fact, some quality technical writing textbooks available for that, uh, for that subject. Uh, this isn't the case for other English subjects, and I'm not sure if the reason has to do with the lack of interest in OER among my colleagues, uh, the difficulty of finding useful OER online, or the amount of resources that actually go into creating new OER. I think it's probably a combination of these factors, but there aren't th these aren't insurmountable challenges. I've gotten to interact with a lot of smart people creating a lot of cool things over the past couple of years and even at even at the conference over the past couple of days. And that actually gives me a really positive outlook for the future of OER in English and beyond. Next slide, please. I'll end with this. Uh, this was a really fun project. Uh, I wanted to undertake it for my students, and I'm already thinking of how I might do something similar for a literature course or something else. Uh, but I'm glad I didn't do it for free. Uh, the funding I secured helped compensate me for all the extra hours I put into working with OER, but it also helped pay for the professional development, external reviewer, the video work, and without those things, I don't think I would have been able to create something that was useful to others outside of my immediate classroom. Uh, I think we need to keep advocating for OER and encouraging others to explore it, but we also need to acknowledge that OER isn't actually free. Uh, the way it gets paid for is just different. Um, I think right before lunch, Joseph Locke and Ben Wright uh, talked about this in, in another session. Um, and they said it a lot more, a lot better than I can here. So I hope that was recorded so y'all can go watch it. Um, but if we can go to the last slide. Um, thank you for listening to this presentation. Um, we hope our experiences might be useful to you as you consider uh, the place of OER in your own subjects. And we're excited to discuss this further if anybody has any questions. Thank y'all so much. I I loved y'all's presentation on it. Um, coming from a library background, I love hearing about faculty members and their interaction uh, with OER. So um, as Jared mentioned, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Or um, if you if you feel the calling, unmute yourself to ask the question. And um, I, I saw that we had one, but I think Tamara already addressed it. Of, of that training with it. But I actually came up with a question. So I'm going to ask my question first uh, while people are typing or thinking of theirs. Um, I wrote down like a lot of good notes. Just um, I'm a metadata librarian to my core on this and one that link rot is real, like and it's everywhere all the time in articles and especially OER type things of. Um, so I wanted to ask if um, you looked into or anyone ever talked to you about like uh, getting stabilized links for things? I can tell you that's something that I have zero experience with. So uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about anybody else, but uh, that is something I think I need to, to look into a little bit more. Yes, because it's it's my second bane. My first is bit rot. My second is link rot um, in my job on things. But oh, uh, we do have a question uh, from Salvador in the chat. Jared, how long was your whole journey? It took about two years. Um, so I found I found the book and then I applied for the grant. And then there was kind of that that waiting time between the pandemic and and other things going on uh, that year that uh, slowed the whole process down when I was finally awarded the grant. Um, that was at the beginning, or that was 
that was just before the the 2021 to 2022 academic year. Um, and I wrote the course, piloted it over that year, um, and I just submitted a finalized version uh, this August um, to OERTX. And uh, we've just started using this full force um, as as the course at NCTC. Um, another question uh, from Rose. Um, this is great information. When you say you all use OER in your course, what type of OER do you use? Just the OER textbook, YouTube, websites, etc. Do you lecture? I can answer first on this. Um, I personally, for the interpersonal communication that I adapted and kind of worked this process through, I was looking for an OER textbook. So I was looking for something a bit more formal. So in that specific course, we do have a textbook and we use one through Libra text, which I am happy to link in as a reference to kind of what it looks like. Um, I use uh, kind of like handouts. It's not a formalized textbook. It just kind of goes unit by unit. And I do have like the instructor, like the instruction, like I would do in the classroom. I have that recorded and those are used when a student is absent. They have uh, access to that in the face-to-face -face classes, but the online classes also use that because um, I could have linked out, but again, students were actually getting security warnings for very common websites. And it just seemed better to avoid that because the students were getting scared asking, you know, can I click on this link? It says it's in, unsecure. Um, and so we, we do have handouts and lecture videos that we use. I just linked my textbook. Um, that is the main OER source that I use. Um, it was published by uh, Oklahoma State University. Um, and uh, I, I really like it. Um, I supplement it with uh, other OER sources as well. Um, and then I, I've got video, video uh, kind of mini lectures almost and content pages. And uh, yeah, I use YouTube a lot and, and all sorts of stuff. <laughs> Excellent. I have another question that I, I have for Sarah. You mentioned um, like doing the training about captioning and them pushing like 100%. Was that a training like there at your institution or was it um, somewhere else? It was um, it was a profession, an online professional development um, from, I guess, uh, a consortium that our colleges uh, connected with, but it wasn't a local one. It was available for the general uh, for the general public, that's part of that consortium. It was a to us a free training. I think if you're not part of the consortium, you pay for that training. Okay. That's my own like. I'm always looking for you know more training like that um, for for our own instruction videos and and wanting to make them as accessible as possible, um, and just the constant learning. That's the thing with all of this. All right, Rose has another question. Um, does THECB still offer this or similar grants or are there other resources you know of? Um, somebody uh, maybe in the audience may actually be able to answer this better than me, but um, I have heard at one point that they said that they had they, they had plans to repeat this grant, um, but I have not seen anything published on that yet. Um, they've done it. They've done a version of it three times so far. The endowment for the humanities, if you look on their uh, list of of grants, they do have one for uh, textbook development. Um, if, if anybody's interested in, in that one. And I can answer this also from the panel presentation I was on yesterday, um, Carrie Gritz, who is the director of the THGCB Digital Learning, uh, mentioned that they are indeed, what Jared said, reopening the THGCB grant. Um, 
really soon. So they, they do plan to do it and they did announce it in our panel presentation yesterday. So yes. That's very exciting. I will say for, for me, it was a really rewarding grant to, to be a part of. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I think uh, the, the professionals development support that they offered in particular was very, very worthwhile. And it was kind of built in, if you're awarded this grant, you, you, you go and you do these things um, that to help, to help you complete the project that you've said you want to complete. So that was probably my favorite part. So I also have a, another question. Oh, Lori, Lori came up first. Jared, are you the only tech writing instructor at your institution? I am not. Uh, there's probably three or four of us that regularly teach technical writing. Um, I think I probably teach it the most and I'm the one that kind of is responsible for maintaining the, um, the course template. Um, and then we have several adjunct instructors that teach it as well that that uh, rely on that template pretty heavily um, especially when they're hired you know right before the semester and that sort of thing salvador has asked jared uh was this grant from your institution uh no i'll actually i'll link in the chat the one that i applied for and then tamar just said that uh, they're going to repeat it but it's offered by the thecb rosa asked sarah are you considered the owner of the course even though it's taught by multiple people and how does the updating work again? Um, I think the college is considered the owner um, because it's in the learning management system, uh, but uh, yes and no. So within our uh, learning management system, uh, the other instructors and I have uh, instructor permissions, but on the course templates, uh, on our shared space, we all have instructor permissions, but on um, in the templates, only I have the instructor level permissions, they have student level permissions, and that's because we already had the issue of a new hire came in and we gave them access to everything to facilitate their first semester and that person went into the master and started making changes instead of first copying over and then making the changes in their personal course. But I, when they need it, I give them, uh, I can give them the instructor level access to make changes. Rose asks, which uh, learning management system do you use? We're using Canvas right now. Yeah, and so it makes it very easy at the beginning of the semester. Um, we can just copy the whole course template over, or if some of them have like um, personalized parts of the courses, which they, they like to do, then we can just copy over the parts that they want. So the question I had for for tomorrow, and actually, I, I believe everyone mentioned this as well, that getting student feedback uh, was a part of the process. And so I was just wondering if there's any like particular feedback that stood out to you or that you particularly like hold to your heart or shift just like good feedback. What's the best feedback you heard? <laughs> That's a great question and it's still a work in process because this is actually the first semester we're, we're piloting it. So um, I, I have like several kind of uh, points in the semester where they're going to give me that qualitative feedback that I haven't gone yet. So this is just their first four to five weeks, just kind of 
interacting with the textbook and just seeing um, just based off like question and answer when we were orienting ourselves to the course, they were really excited about the fact that they had access to the textbook on one and no barriers to uh, uh, the textbook and cost and all those things. So really positive feedback on that. And um, they, they said that they were all in, <laughs> but we'll see as the semester progresses and they have to, you know, write a lot of their assignments through it uh, toward the end of the semester. I'll, I'll have a, a chance where they'll get to write more of a, you know, qualitative uh, feedback on it, more written format. So I have that as a reference. So um, work in progress is my answer on that. <laughs> um. I, I, like Tamar said, my uh, the, my number one student feedback has been uh, how easily they can access everything um, and, and get the textbook on the very first day and start learning. Um, we're able to start the course more quickly um, and uh, jump into material more quickly, which has been really, really nice. Um, and uh, I guess the, the other feedback that I've gotten is the second half of our course is a, a large um, group project um and the majority of their grade is wrapped up in that and that sort of thing which is really terrifying but um i've gotten a lot of really positive feedback from that because i've tried to make it kind of replicate um the the proposal writing process they have to re they have to find a problem and research it and um uh propose a solution um that's that's always that's my favorite part of the semester and it's always been a lot of fun um but uh, students have responded really well to that as well i'll i'll just say i have been i include that as part of the course is towards the end they give feedback where would they have preferred a traditional textbook did they feel like they were supported enough did they feel like the instructional materials gave them the information that they needed. And consistently, they always say they would not want a textbook. Um, I, I was surprised because I didn't expect it to be so overwhelmingly in favor. I don't think I've ever had a student say, oh, I wish I had paid so that I could get this information. None of them have done that. But I will say something that I uh, heard uh, as I was beginning to design, I had heard from another instructor and it's very important to take into account how the students access the course. So in my introduction to the course, uh, well, not my personal one, but the introduction to the course that everybody uh, has access to, it kind of tells the student, hey, you need to access it through this view, because if they try and shortcut it and just work through the gradebook, they don't see that there's instructional materials, they only see the assignments, and then they don't know how in the world they're supposed to know that information other than looking it up. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd add this after what Sarah said. I, I don't think I've ever had a student say that I, I wish I had paid for a textbook, but I have had a couple say I, I miss physical textbooks. Um, and I think mm -hmm. that's something we do have to acknowledge is um, when we convert everything to an OER format like this and, and the digital mm -hmm. format, yes, they can they can print the textbook I use out as a PD, uh, you know, from a PDF, but it's not quite the same. Um, and uh, I think some students find that shift uh, a little bit of a challenge sometimes. I know in, in my course on Li Libra text where the textbook is housed, um, they do have an option for students to order a print copy um, for $20 and some odd change, including uh, their shipping costs, and it, it is compiled more in a textbook traditional format um, rather than, you know, printing their own PDF, but they do have that option as well. So I think that was also another thing that I really valued about the textbook that I chose, because I do have, just like Jared, a uh, number of students every semester that ask me, like, I do, I learn better if I can write margin notes, and it's nice to give that 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 option to them. Absolutely. Well, with an eye to the time, it's uh, 1 55. And so I understand if people need to leave, we have received a few more questions um, coming through. And so um, if our speakers have time and would like to stay, um, then we'll continue uh, with the questions that way. But I, I do acknowledge um, that maybe other people have a 2 p.m. appointment um, to go to as well. So 
I, I do want to take this time to thank our speakers so much. This has been a wonderful uh, conversation among colleagues and friends about the great work that y'all are doing there with OERs uh, there at your institution. And so a round of applause. Um, and I want to also thank all of um, our audience for um, attending today. I'm going to stop the recording now, but I'm going to stay in the room as long as the speakers and people would like to, to answer questions or continue talking. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I, I did see one question. I'm, I'm happy to stay for a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know 